Hello, a warm welcome to one and all. Today, I am going to present my review on the book The Bottom Billion by Paul Collier. A few words about the author of the book. Paul Collier is a professor of economics and director of Center for the Study of African Economics at Oxford University. He is the winner of the 2008 Lionel Gilbert Prize. Coming to the introduction. For the past four decades, the development challenge has been the rich world of 1 million people facing poor world of 5 billion people. About 80% of the 5 billion people live in developing countries. The real challenge of development is there are a few countries at the bottom billion that are faced that are falling behind and are often falling apart. Paul Collier through this book takes a dynamic approach of the problems faced by the bottom billion, the reason why they are falling behind and what can be done about this. The arguments Collier points out are based on conclusions from his exhaustive list of peer review research. He was successful in answering the questions stated on the cover of the book. This book is divided into five parts. Coming to the first part, which introduces the issue. Even in the golden era of 1990s, when all the countries are developing, the incomes in the bottom billion declined by 5%. There are about 58 countries that fall into bottom billion. About 1 million people live in these countries. 70% of these are in Africa, the rest in other places, which Collier describes these countries as Africa Plus. The per capita income of these countries is less than that of most rich world cities. Now, let us look at few differences between developing and the bottom billion countries. From the data, it can be seen that during 1970s, bottom billion diverged from the developing world by 2% a year. In 1980s, they diverged at the rate of 4.4% a year. And in 1990s, they diverged at 5% a year, which describes the traps of development. Collier believes that bottom million countries have fallen into one or more of the four traps. The four traps he points out are the conflict trap, the natural resource trap, landlocked countries trap, bad governance trap. The two forms of political conflict, civil war and coup d'etat can trap a country in poverty. Low level of income, slow growth and dependence upon primary commodity exports are the factors underlying proneness to civil war. The end of civil war is not just the end of conflict, it is likely to restart. Discovery of natural resources can increase prosperity but sometimes it contributed to conflict trap. Resource exports causes countries' currency to raise in value. This makes other export activities uncompetitive that might have been the best vehicles for technological progress. Resource revenue worsens governance. Dutch disease increases the exchange rate and salaries, making the products costly and less competitive. Collier points that one aspect of geography matters for development. Being landlocked to around half a percentage point of the growth rate. The cities that were capitals of landlocked countries incurred high transport costs. Transport to landlocked countries depended on its coastal neighbor transport infrastructure. Compared to resource scarce landlocked country, resource rich landlocked country have chance of making success. Being both resource scarce, landlocked and having neighbors who do not have opportunities condemns a country to slow growth. Over 30% of Africa's population lives in landlocked resource scarce countries. Terrible governance and policies destroy economy and causes an inflation of over 1000% a year. The reason why bad governance is persistent in some countries is that the leaders of the poorest countries are themselves among the global super rich. Moreover, in these countries, there are only few educated people to bring the reform. Kalia called the bottom billion low-income countries below the cutoff for government and economic policies for a continuous period of four years as failing states. 
an incipient reform was more likely to progress to a sustained turnaround if the country had higher income, larger population, and more educated people. Powered majority of developing countries towards prosperity, it is now harder for the latecomers. Let us see the three aspects of globalization. 80% of the developing countries now are manufacturers and service exports, which caused equitable and rapid development. There is firm relocating from United States, Europe to Asia due to a wide wage gap. Now that Asia has managed to establish itself on the scene, bottom billion countries will have to wait long time for its turn. Bottom billion countries are short of capital. Labor force of bottom billion needs private capital. The only inflow of private investment to bottom billion is to finance the extraction of natural resources. Kalia, along with Cathy, investigated the reason why the bottom billion failed to attract the capital inflows and found that perceived risk of investment, very small economy of bottom billion and policy improvements that are fragile to be the reasons. Bottom billion's own capital flows out of them, which mostly illegal and hidden. Losing capital partly is because of traps. Most educated people migrated into developing and developed countries. The flight of skilled people made it difficult for the failing state to turn around and escape the bad governance trap. Adding up all, the bottom billion countries are failing to converge. To help the bottom billion countries make into global economy, there are several instruments. Aid. Aid speeds up the growth process. Over the last 30 years, it added 1% to the annual growth rate of bottom billion. Collier points out that the biggest deviation was that the aid mostly from the European Commission was going into middle-income countries rather than to bottom billion. In post-conflict countries, aid helps to increase the income and growth, thereby breaking the conflict trap. Aid in landlocked countries is to improve the transport links to the coast. But it failed as the aid was shifted from infrastructure to social priorities. The other reason being the transport links depended on the neighboring countries. Aid can help turn around as incentives, skills and reinforcement. Use of aid as incentive for policy improvement is known as policy conditionality. Kalia suggests governance conditionality, which is shift of power from governments to their own citizens. Aid as providing skilled people to failing states for turnaround is called technical assistance and contributes to around one-fourth of the total aid. Aid is effective once the turnaround has started. The remaining three-fourths of the aid is provided as money to governments for projects or budget support. Aid can be spent on helping export sector and on activities that have large import content, thereby offsetting the Dutch disease. Aid improves opportunities for private investment, thereby reducing capital flight. Aid is not the only measure for helping bottom billion, but it is the easiest thing for the Western world to do. External military intervention helps societies of bottom billion by restoration of order, maintaining post-conflict peace, and preventing against coup. In post-conflict situations, bottom billion countries spend more on military to reduce future risk. 40% of military spending is financed by aid from the West. Kalia proposes the notion of global charters on issues such as natural resource revenues, democracy, budget transparency, recovery of post-conflict countries, and investment to impede sudden capital flight. Kalia says that international charters could be powerful forces for improving governance. Aid versus the problem of trade barriers. Trade liberalization is one of the remedies for Dutch disease and the amount of it depends upon what aid is used for. The solution to the bottom billion trade is regional integration. Bottom billion needs to diversify their exports into labor using manufacturers and services. For the bottom billion to break into these markets, they need temporary protection from Asia. Tim points out that although Kolia has pointed out that there are about 58 bottom billion countries, a few of them are named. It is unclear who exactly the 58 are, and so one cannot assess some of the Collier claims about the bottom billion. Despite the apparent precision of the percentages, we never learn exactly which countries are on each trap, nor the precision criteria for assignment. Collier sometimes uses causality when using GDP or economic growth, which is variable. There are no reports of robustness for the causality, and the book emits levels of statistical significance, explanatory power, and diagnostic tests. 
Reader points out that Collier doesn't use the right criteria for measuring success. He points that although Collier makes an important distinction between the bottom billion and the rest, he tends to overdraw it. The developing world still has a long way to go before it catches up the western levels of prosperity. Even China, which is so much talked about with its rapid development over the past few decades, will have to wait many more decades to wait, catch up with the west. This book is not about global poverty and the title is misleading. The bottom billion is not the poorest billion people in the world, but the people living in poorest and most stagnant countries in the world. Daniel Ben says that India is not one of the Collier bottom billion countries and thus he ignores the reality that there are more people living below the poverty line in India alone than in whole of Africa. He fails to address the plight of the very poor who lives in moderately poor countries. He implausibly states that the cost of a civil war is around $64 billion with no evidence. He also places too much confidence in simple correlation across countries. For countries that broke the traps, big push aid that is large and temporary should be provided to raise export infrastructure up to global level. Instrument charter should encourage private investment. Bottom billion countries need to be protected against Asian genes. So who should make it happen? Aid agencies should concentrate in most difficult environments. They need to accept more risk and there is a need for increased project supervision. Aid agencies need to intervene strategically, finance big push strategies for export diversification and should introduce governance conditionality. Not only US, Britain, France, all other big countries have an important role to play in case of military intervention. International charters such as the powerful forces for improving governance in bottom billion. Charters would empower reformers, which would enable countries at early stages of turnaround to rock and change. Charter for post-conflict government should be promulgated by peace building in United Nations. Temporary protection of bottom billion from Asia is needed. Aid is over-relied. Even if the aid is doubled, it cannot resolve the problem of bottom billion. All the three other instruments, that is security, trade and standards need to be coordinated. Governments of the bottom billion countries need to become more ambitious and develop strategies appropriate for the circumstances. Aid just cannot solve problems. We need a wide range of policies. As ordinary citizens, we need to learn a range of policies needed for the bottom billion. Kalia suggests the ways the thinking needs to be changed. Development problem is a focused problem of around a billion people in countries that are struck. Within the bottom billion countries, there is a struggle between the brave trying to achieve change and our groups who oppose them. We do not need to be bystanders. Our support can be decisive.